Paul, you're on mute. Looks like we're getting a good audience. I see 36 participants out there. Oh, no. No pressure, Paul Hartz. Try to behave yourself. <laughs> Do you have the bleep button and is there a delay? <laughs> then this is being recorded, so. Oh, man. Hope my mom's not watching. There's no radio 10 second pause. <laughs> no, exactly. <laughs> So we're going to go ahead and get started. We may have one more panelist who jumps in. He was it appears he was having trouble um, connecting. So I think Allison will keep an eye out for him. Uh, welcome to Manufacturing Days 2020, the virtual version of Manufacturing Days, which we're excited about. And also it's like, this is a, a whole different world uh, than buses and Chick-fil-A and permission slips. But we're really excited about the opportunities that it presents. So um, thanks to everybody for being a part of this manufacturing days and attending this particular session. All attendees are muted. So if you're an, a panelist, you can see, but attendees are muted. And, we do the, and we've done this as a webinar so that we can record it and not worry about privacy with students. So that's why um, if you're an attendee, you can't see yourself or unmute yourself because we've done that on purpose. Um, so, but that's for your own personal safety. So this session is scheduled for 40 minutes. And we'll be sharing with your questions with our speakers so you can use the Q&A function. So if you have a question, make sure and drop it into the Q&A and then we can um, ask that of our panelists. So we wanna thank sponsors for Manufacturing Days 2020. You can find the full list on the Manufacturing Days landing page, which we hope you've already visited or will soon. This session is sponsored by Purdue Polytechnic High School. They and our other sponsors recognize the important role manufacturing plays in our region and want to help ensure you learn about these businesses and the great career opportunities they offer. Um, we have a great panel ready to tell you more about engineering career pathways and the ways you can prepare locally for those careers. And our moderator for this panel is Dr. Megan Pragoski, a mechanical engineer who teaches mechanical engineering at Purdue Polytechnic Institute South Bend. So welcome Megan and thanks for moderating this panel. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead. Um, our panelists right now that we have, we have Paul Hartz, who is the president of Mac Tool, and then we have Megan Ogden, who is a director of quality and continuous improvement at Special Light. Um, so I'll let each of you, um, we're waiting on potentially one more panelist, but we'll start with the two of you. Um, I'll let each of you kind of give a, I guess, brief-ish introduction of yourselves, and maybe kind of as you introduce yourselves, you could talk about how you chose your career. Um, okay. We'll start with Megan, I guess. Excellent. All right. Well, as Megan said, my name is Megan as well. <laughs> um, I'm currently the Director of Quality and Continuous Improvement at a company in Decatur called Special Light, and we manufacture uh, primarily doors for uh, commercial businesses like hospitals and schools. I graduated from Western Michigan University, go Broncos, um, with a mechanical engineering degree. And uh, later went on to get my MBA, um, mostly because I felt like it helped me uh, be well-rounded and focus more on business and not just the engineering aspect of my job. So my career um, started at Stryker as an intern when I was still in college. And from there, I went to Whirlpool. And I spent 13 years at Whirlpool in a variety of different roles from uh, cost and quality engineering on top load washing machines to uh, quality on front load washing machines. I spent some time in product development as well as global project leadership and refrigeration. And eventually um, I left Whirlpool to pursue an opportunity at Landscape Forms and now I find myself at Specialite. So 
Uh, careers can take a lot of different paths and turns based on your experiences over the years. And that's one thing that, um, that I really learned is to pursue your passions and find the things that you really, really enjoy. Those are the things that you're going to excel uh, at doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Love what you do and do what you love. Um, for me, that happens to be math and problem solving and working with teams and people. So outside of work, if um, you can find me, I'm usually running or biking or golfing. Okay, thank you. Um, let's move on to Paul for a introduction, how you chose your career? Okay, uh, my name is Paul Hartz, President of Mac Tool and Engineering. Uh, I, at the age of 12, was going to be a veterinarian. Uh, so I spent a lot of time uh, working at horse farms and vet clinics uh, with the idea I was going to go to Purdue University and get in their veterinary program. Uh, veterinary is very competitive to get into. Uh, when I was not able to get into the veterinary program, um, I used, I transferred into the engineering program at Purdue. Uh, used all of my um, uh, biology as uh, elective courses and took three or three or two and a half years of nothing but engineering courses at Purdue. Uh, so once again, kind of things changed. Uh, I was fortunate that in my junior year, uh, I got a phone call from my mom saying my dad was crazy. He was going to mortgage a house and start a machine shop and was going to fail and spend the rest of his life working. As it turned out, he kind of knew what he was doing. Uh, I started working uh, that summer uh, for the company when it was only four employees. Um, uh, since then, we've grown it to as many as 80 employees. Uh, we're down a little bit now because of what's going on with COVID, uh, but I kind of got in at the ground floor. Uh, pretty much I've swept the floors. I've done quality. I've done engineering, uh, human resources. Um, I wear a lot of different hats um, and kind of grown it to a, a world-class manufacturing for medical and aerospace parts. Uh, medical, uh, we make surgical instruments, surgical implants, trials. Uh, when they put you on a table, they don't necessarily know what size implant they're going to use on you. So they build your geometry up at trials in order to get your geometry where it needs to be. So your legs, the right length and your offset between the center line of your body to the outside of the body is correct. And then they go get that implant, put you in uh, from an aerospace side. We do a lot of work for the Honeywells of the world, the GEs of the world, um, uh, producing fuel control parts, hydraulic control parts, actuation parts. Um, uh, so they keep us pretty busy doing that. Thank you. And then our third panelist is Dan Shoup. Uh, hopefully I'm saying that correctly from the University of Notre Dame. So I'll let you introduce yourself and then kind of talk about how you briefly chose your career. Hi, uh, I'm Dan Shoup. And um, like Paul, my plans had changed early on. My, uh, out of high school, I expected the uh, Dallas Cowboys to draft me directly out of high school <laughs> and have a NFL career. But when that didn't happen, I decided to go to Michigan State uh, get an engineering degree, and uh, that decision was made solely on um, a recommendation of a friend of mine's uh, father who said I would be a good engineer because he had worked in that uh, industry. Um, and like uh, Megan, I've made uh, quite a few changes in my engineering career. I've worked in manufacturing where I've worked with small pieces, parts, making um, uh, fire protection equipment at Elkhart Brass. I've worked in uh, pipe fitting where uh, a pipe being quarter inch uh, is close enough versus three thousandths is close enough in some of the machining or half thousandths. Um, I've uh, worked in industrial type manufacturing making uh, modular control houses for gas turbine power plants and I've worked in nuclear power plants um, up at DC Cook. Uh, currently, I work at the University of Notre Dame, been there for just about 13 years. Um, I work in the utilities department, uh, most of my time spent in the power plant, um, where we provide heat and electricity for uh, the campus. Um, I function largely as a uh, project engineer, project manager, um, installing and managing uh, large capital projects where we added new equipment or upgrade existing equipment. Um, so that's who I am and what I do. Thank you. Um, so we've got a list of questions. I'm kind of going to skip around based on the information you guys just gave us. Um, 
So going back to your first job, and I know a couple of you touched on where your job started, um, but what is something you learned in your first job that you still use today? Um, and I guess we'll go in the same order. So we'll start with Megan again. Um, well, my, my first job was actually in a restaurant. Um, my parents owned restaurants. So I had the opportunity at a young age to wash dishes and learn how to cook. And um, what that really taught me was the idea of service and working in a team and really building relationships. And that's something that has stuck with me my whole career. Um, you're never going to be successful in a team environment by yourself. So you have to learn how to work with people and build relationships and not only learn from others, but be willing to teach other people. So, you know, I took that through college and then really uh, my first job at Stryker as a manufacturing engineering intern, that's when I really figured out that engineering is a hands-on experience and also where I figured out, like, I actually do want to be an engineer. Um, problem solving, day-to-day -day life on the manufacturing floor, and again, building relationships and getting work done with other people and through other people was very rewarding. Thank you. Um, I guess same question to Paul. What's something you learned in your first job that you still use today? Uh, well, it's my first job. I was working for a veterinarian. Uh, I had a small animal clinic on a horse farm. It was really accountability and responsibility. Uh, you're accountable for your actions. You're, uh, uh, you know, maintaining the health of horses and of people's animals that bring them in and the responsibility that you, you need to uh, understand and, you know, and take uh, when you have that type of, you know, uh, position, uh, you know, and it's no different today as being president of the company, uh, you know, except it's, you know, as the president of the company, I have to solve all problems. The rest of my employees can't solve. So it's the same accountability and responsibility, you know, from one end, one level to the next. Uh, uh, that carries throughout. And if you can do that, you will excel and always be good at whatever it is you do. So it's kind of the short answer. How's that? Sounds good. Um, and then Dan, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I had a few part-time jobs, but my first real job um, after engineering school uh, was with mechanical pipe fitters, a mechanical contractor that utilized uh, union pipe fitters. And the most important uh, um, uh, job, the most important thing that I learned there was working as a team, te treating everybody the same and in important. Um, union pipe fitters can be a rough and tumble uh, crowd. And if you don't treat them with respect, even though they don't have your college education, um, they'll treat you like a snot-nosed kid and they won't uh, give you the time of day. So um, I needed them, they needed me, treat everybody with respect. Um, everybody has something to offer, uh, regardless of their position or their background. Everybody needs to work together. So teamwork, working together is the, the, what I learned. Um, I'm gonna kind of piggyback off of that with the kind of some some careers needing college degrees, some not. Um, so kind of looking at where you work, uh, you can focus on your individual career or people that you work with. Um, are there special skills, certification or education required? So I think a lot of people think I'm gonna need this degree or this certification. What are some of the, some qualifications that you would need to work in, in your field right now, whether it's with your job title or people that you work with? Um, and so let's I guess, go back to Megan. Um, I'm thinking about uh, a variety of roles that we have um, around the organization. And, you know, I think it's really dependent on the individual and how willing they are to put themselves out there and learn and be hands on. Um, if you're willing to learn and grow, um, the possibilities are endless. I mean, there are um, a long list of uh, certificates and different degree options, but I would say it really starts with with you and your willingness to learn. So, you know, from an engineering perspective, there's 
design of experiments and components of variation and all sorts of um, you know fancy terms for different ways to solve problems. Um, and, and those all add value in your career. It really just starts with your desire to learn. All right. All right. And then Paul, same question to you. Is it degree uh, required with, certifications? Yeah, I'm gonna where, uh, pick up where Megan left off. It's really up to the individual. As a person, you have to decide what you want in life, uh, how much time you're willing to work at it, um, what kind of money your expectation is you wanna make out of it. Are you a person that wants to be a millionaire? Are you a person that's happy with the nine to five job? Uh, Cause I'm gonna have a family and there's other things I do. Uh, as a person, and those are all legitimate questions. They just have to answer. At Map Tool, we've got the whole gamut. Uh, we have people that are entry level positions that are happy with their entry level position. They're good employees. Map Tool needs those entry level people. Uh, they get paid a fair wage. Uh, uh, they're not doing anything to um, uh, progress themselves, uh, and that's okay at Map Tool. But there are some people that start off as entry level and have worked our way all the way up to. Um, uh, basically second or third in command at Mac Tool and Engineering. Uh, they got there by continuously learning, uh, either internally or externally, um, going out and getting secondary degrees, um, or the whole gamut of what it takes in order to learn to make yourself a better employee for the company you're working for, or to build yourself in a position where you've kind of grown out of working at Mac Tool and Engineering, and you've gone on to other companies. You know, I take a lot of pride in the fact that people have progressed through Mac Tool and Engineering, got to the point where you know, they were kind of roadblocked at Mac Tool because, you know, as you go up at the scale, it's kind of a pyramid. You only need one president at the top, but you got a lot of people at the bottom. Um, and they progressed to the point where they left Mac Tool and Engineering for a better opportunity. And I kind of, as a president, and you know, that put that environment in place, I'm proud of that. I don't take it personal that they left Mac Tool and went on to better themselves because I was not able to give them that opportunity. But as a person, that's what you need to look at. And you need to determine what's important to you where you are in your life, your, you know, the family becomes big when you start having kids and you know how that plays into your decision-making of what you do. And that's just kind of all part of life and you know, uh, uh, getting through it. Thank you, and then the same question to you, Dan. Um, well, I have a mechanical engineering degree. I have a professional engineering license for the state of Indiana. Um, Neither one of those is necessarily essential for what I do at Notre Dame. I do not stamp drawings. I do not do certified calculations for my, with my professional engineering license. Now, the degree that I got, the education that's behind that was important in getting my first job, which gets me experience. And, and that is really what's important. You know, Megan mentioned that she loves math. I do not like math. It's, it, it's a necessary evil for me, you know, so <laughs> as I look back at differential equations and linear algebra and all that, it was, it was absolutely painful. It was just something I had to do. I, I had to get through and I had to get the engineering degree, but, you know, beyond that, what I do in everyday work is algebra, if anything, and, and below there, I, I don't do any advanced math, math but it's, it's uh, teamwork and working together. Um, you know, as Paul mentioned um, about your initiative and what you want to do um, it, at the Notre Dame power plant, there's maybe three or four people that have um, a degree of some sort of or, or another. Some of them are, are organization and management um, degrees. Some are engineering degrees. Uh, a lot of them are experienced through the military, their Navy experience and training that the Navy gave them. Um, but once they get into the door, beyond that, it's it's their initiative, their hard work, wherever it wants to take them. Like like Paul said, you you can you can come in as an A mechanic or excuse me, a B mechanic or a B operator, and you can make a living a, a living wage doing that, and and just do your job, punch the clock, and go home, and and you'll perform fine. But anybody that wants to step up and, and go to the next level has that opportunity. And it doesn't necessarily have to be with what they brought to the power plant. It's what they developed there. Um, and it's just, it's uh, opportunities within um, the power plant to 
get involved with every little project or even take you know outside courses but but more than anything it's just initiative and hard work and what you want to do and then we have a question from um, one of our participants. So I'll skip to that one and maybe I'll ask it in reverse order. So we'll start with you, Dan. Um, the question was what type of engineering, so mechanical, electrical, software, quality, whatever type, um, what type of engineering, and you can pick a couple, I guess, do you think are the most helpful in the long run? Maybe relevant to your career or your experience? There's obviously not one right answer, but in your opinion, what is gonna be the most beneficial to students to pursue? Well, I guess I would be biased towards mechanical um, because that's what I am. I mentioned that my career choice was uh, guided by a friend of mine's dad. Um, and he said I would be a good engineer. And I said, OK, well, what kind of engineer? And he said, if, if you were to get a dual degree in electrical and mechanical, you'd be set. You know, you, you could do anything. And I, I actually started Mi Michigan State with that idea um, way back in 1990, and they didn't have a combined electrical mechanical degree. Um, I was going to go another year or two and, and get that. Um, but through internships, I saw what mechanicals did and what electricals did, and, and, and I like mechanicals. Now, um, another reason that I think that that would be beneficial is there are so many different things that you can do with them. You know, I, I, you can make small widgets, you can do machining, you can do, you know, power boilers, nuclear plants, all that. You know, I've done all of that with a mechanical engineering degree. Um, I'm older than I want to admit. And, uh, you know, the, the computers and technology are advancing faster and faster. So there, there could be some argument for um, computer electrical or, you know, electronics and that, that type of engineering. Um, but to me, the computers don't work unless the lights are on and the electricity is running. So start there making power electrical and then go from there. So I like electrical or excuse me. I like mechanical. I like mechanical. All right, um, same question to you, Paul, what field of engineering do you think is most applicable, um, either to your career or to the area or? Yeah, um, uh, I'll date myself. I was in the engineering school over 30 years ago when I was in uh, the first year and a half to two years was pretty much the same classes you took, whether no matter what your discipline of engineering was at Purdue University. And there was probably only three or five classes differentiated you by the time you got out. Um, if I was a, a, a person, young person thinking of going to engineering school, I would just kind of uh, not go what the old guy says. Uh, I would kind of see what the current careers look like, you know, what the future of those career uh, going forward look like, what the pay scale looks like. Uh, do not be afraid in life to go out and get a job that makes money. Uh, you know, everybody says you should do it because you enjoy it, but if you can do it because you can enjoy it and it pays better than the average job, that's a plus plus win win situation. So don't be don't be afraid to look at something and, and shy away from it just because you know it makes a lot of money or is the, the higher paying job in the two. Um, but you know you gotta at this point you know I'm the old guy. You kind of got to look to see what the future holds uh, for engineering. Uh, remember that I'm still pretty sure the first year of two of classes are going to be the same no matter what engineering you get into for what you have. Uh, you're the you're shaking your head. You're the engineering school student, right? Kind of still the same way now. Um, very similar classes to start off. Yeah. yeah. Um, whoop, they turned the lights off on me. Um, <laughs> and then just, uh, start working it forward. I think engineers, you know, I'm an engineer that spent 30 years at the same job. That really doesn't happen. I don't believe with most engineers. I think most engineers jump around from one job to the next in a career situation in order to basically get what they want out of life. I think a basic engineer, you know, that's good at engineering school is a problem solver, is not content with where they're at. They want to go somewhere and build on what they do. And at some point in time, you just got to sometimes move from one job to the next in order to get that. But don't be afraid to do that either. It's not a bad thing. Then same question to you, Megan. Sure. I guess um, I like Dan. I'm a little biased as a mechanical engineer. I think uh, you can't really go wrong. It's a very well-rounded um, education and approach, and you get a little bit of everything with, uh, with the curriculum that comes with a mechanical engineering degree. Um, 
but I think one of the hidden gems is manufacturing engineering. And it's something you don't hear very often, but um, to me, that's a foundation of everything we do. The materials and the processes that are used to make all of the parts, all the metals and plastics and all of the different processes to put the parts together and create the assemblies, um, there's a lot to be said there. So the mechanical engineering degree is probably my most favorite, but I love the manufacturing as well. I'll just add a couple of comments. Paul had mentioned um, checking in the kind of pay scales as well. Um, that is something most universities should advertise when they um, are trying to get you into a degree program. At least I know Purdue does that. Um, they'll give you kind of a starting pay scale for people in the local area. So it's definitely something to check out. There are discrepancies between different types of engineering, um, but I wouldn't, don't pick one just because it has the highest number, but if it interests you and it's a good number, then that would be a reason to go for it. Um, so another question, um, let's, let me see. Um, how do you see your job um, in the field changing? So we kind of touched on different career paths or different majors might be more common since the world is changing. How do you see your job right now um, changing in the near future, long future? Um, let's start with Paul this time, change it up okay. a little bit. Um, well, right now we're heavily affected by the coronavirus uh, because the, our tie to the aerospace industry making airplane parts uh, for what we have going on. So we have actually here at MacTool uh, uh, are going out and getting different certifications so that we can do more medical work. I think medical is not as down as much as aerospace is right now and will come back faster than what aerospace has come back now. Um, I'm not sure kind of how that applies to, you know, the, uh, the, the forum we're having here other than as a person, you can never kind of settle into who you are and what you do. You kind of, at some point in time, have to take what's given you. And, you know, when you're given oranges, you make orange juice. And when you're given limes, you make lime juice. Uh, and, you know, as an engineer, as a problem solver, then you just, you can't, you can't bucket, you know, a Mac tool is not bigger than the coronavirus. So we cannot, you know, dictate what happens. We have to be reactive to what happens to take advantage of what's given to us. So, um, it doesn't change the base model of the business, but you know, it does change us on a daily basis what we have to do to survive, so. Um, and then Dan, same question, how is your field? Do you think it'll change in the future? Well, I think it, it's changing, the, the specific job I do in, in the industry I work in is changing. Um, you know, if I look at what I do is power generation, we take uh, fuel and we, create steam and we ultimately make electricity out of that. Um, for decades, the University of Notre Dame did that process utilizing coal. Uh, but because of environmental concerns, um, regulations and just uh, concerns for uh, the environment, we, we've transitioned away from coal into utilizing natural gas. Um, so that, that's a cleaner fuel, um, but uh, even beyond that, uh, it's still a fossil fuel. So we're trying to use it as the, the most efficient way that we can. And there, there's another technology, instead of using just a, a boiler that to have a flame to make steam, we are using combustion turbines that are fired by the natural gas. So essentially it's a jet engine that is connected, coupled directly to a electrical generator and we get direct electricity off of that, but out of the jet engine, there's hot uh, flue gas um, that comes off of that. And then we sent that through a kind of a waste boiler. It's a heat recovery steam generator, Hertzig. It's a fancy boiler. Um, so again, we're getting the steam, we're getting the electricity. We're just doing it with different technologies. Whether it was coal, then it was natural gas as a flame. Now it's natural gas as a combustion turbine uh, propulsion. Um, and, you know, the controls of the power plant, um, you know, it was old pneumatics and, and then it went into digital. Now it's all computer. We, we, we are actuating, we are controlling the power plant with a computer that clicking, you know, um, there, there's very few switches and, and knobs you can go and turn when stuff goes wrong. You've got to have the computer running. So, um, you know, that's where that computer programming, computer engineering comes into effect. You, you've got 
it, you know, of course, with that, you've got some exposure with cybersecurity. Anybody that can get into your computer can control your power plant. So you got to have firewalls. You got to have separation from the outside world. So again, we're doing the same thing, providing heat and electricity, but we're doing it in different and evolving ways. And then I guess same question, Megan. Uh, this one's so interesting. All of our our perspectives and answers are so different. So um, I'm taking from the lens of customers. So being the director of quality, um, my primary goal is to ensure customer satisfaction. And you know those are end customers, people that are buying and installing our doors, but they're also our internal customers. So each step in our process, um, inside our four walls, right? There, there are customers along the way. So um, customers' expectations continue to grow and we have to have great quality every day, all day. So when I think about our roles changing, you know, how do we enable our internal customers to have great quality and great throughput? So it's, it's about um, eliminating waste in the process and creating good systems and processes internally so that we meet customer expectations, whether those are customers on the manufacturing floor or the final customers that are purchasing and installing our products. Um, thank you. Another question, I'm gonna kind of combine two of them from the viewers. Um, if you could comment on things that, based on your industry experience, something that you would physically make um, with either a mechanical or an electrical engineering degree. And then someone asked, um, related to that, um, if you do mechanical engineering, do you work and build on cars? So obviously you can do other things with it, but any personal experience with things that you would build with a mechanical or electrical degree, and if any of that relates to cars. Um, so start with Megan again. Sure. Um, I do not work on cars first. <laughs> I can change my oil. <laughs> but beyond that, no. Um, as a kid, I did uh, tinker and take a lot of things apart and put them back together. And I think that's how a lot of um, teenagers and young adults get interested in engineering is is by working on cars and taking things apart and that's probably the first big thing that we all have the opportunity to really work on is a car. Um, my early experience with building things was for fixtures. So these were little gadgets or widgets that would assist in production um, on the shop floor. So maybe it was something to hold a piece in a, a press while you press another component into it. Um, or it was uh, a fixture to aid in assembly. But that was my early on um, design experience was really with the fixtures. Um, same question to Paul, things that you might make with either mechanical or electrical degrees. Yeah, I'd like to first start, um, I think kind of a misconception about engineering school is they think you go to school and they teach you how to build things and they really don't teach you how to build things. They teach you right, how to write mathematical equations that explains how systems work so that you can control them. So you basically, every engineering course is really not a course on building something, it's a course on writing mathematical equations. Um, everything else is dictated by that first job that you get out of engineering school. So if your first job you get out of engineering school is an aerospace customer, they're gonna teach you how to build airplanes. You're gonna be working with building airplane parts. Uh, if you go get a job, you know, I think Ryan Newman is a mechanical engineer out of Purdue University. Uh, if you go start working for a race team, uh, then you're, you're gonna learn how to build cars. And you're gonna use that information you took from the engineering courses on how to manipulate and build a car. Um, so it comes down to, again, um, you know, in, every, everything you see in your life has been engineered by somebody to do what it does. Um, so when it, the question is, what types of things do you do as an engineer? You just have to look around you in your house and as you drive down the street and everything has been engineered, everything, that's, the math has been done on it, calculated and figured. Uh, your experience and what you do is going to end up being on the jobs you have. So if you're a person that wants to work on cars, 
you need to, uh, uh, when it comes time to looking to get a job, you need to figure out who the car people are that hire man engineers. And that's the, who you apply to. That's who you focus on. That's who you try to get internships with. And that's really where you have to do your due diligence and kind of go out and fight for what it is you want to uh, um, uh, be a part of and just not wait till the end of your four year or five year or whatever it takes to get through engineering school and say, okay, well, you know, now I'm going to pick and choose what it is. So it's really kind of up to you as an individual, as an engineer, there's engineering and everything you see in your daily life everywhere, coffee pots, you know, your bed, everything. Um, yeah, same question, Dan. Um, I do work on cars. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer that enjoys being a mechanic. Um, I recently bought a 1977 MGB little bitty convertible and it's not necessarily I bought it to drive it but to work on it um, because I, I enjoy that 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 part of it. Um, I do have a really old 1984 Honda ATV that uh, I was recently, recently working on and I discovered it has the same starter mechanism design as our six million dollar <laughs> gas turbine jet engines at Notre Dame. Um, so uh, I enjoy learning that kind of stuff. As Paul said, that's nothing that they taught me in, in college. I uh, didn't know anything about that, um, but uh, it, it's stuff that I'm still learning. Um, when I was at Michigan State, um, being in the state of Michigan, um, probably 80% of the people that I went to school with, uh, their dream was to run to Detroit or Pontiac or wherever and work for the car industry. And I did know a few that uh, did go and do that. Um, they weren't necessarily as satisfied with the, with the career choice. Um, they thought they were gonna be there, you know, designing in the next Corvette. And, you know, they got assigned to a team that was working on the uh, mirror mechanism and, and how that integrates into the door that integrates into the side panel that, you know, it, it's all a teamwork there. And so they were working on one very, very small component um, of the car. They're not going to bring them in and let them, you know, redo a new engine. Um, and, and they were getting excited about, you know, having squeezed 35 cents of manufacturing cost out of this door assembly. And uh, that, that, that's what got them up in the morning is, is doing that. So it, 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 it all depends on what you want to do with it. Um, I have worked in manufacturing jobs at Elkhart Brass where they were designing firefighting equipment. The R&D, the, you know, using that a uh, fire nozzle to hook to a hose and put out a fire was was very exciting and, and fun. Um, I didn't enjoy counting ball bearings and doing solid, solid modeling of that device, you know, um, going into the manufacturing of it. So um, it depends on what you want to do with it and, and you need to enjoy what you do every day or you won't be any good at it. Thank you. Um, just kind of to add to that, um, we do have a lot of local manufacturers that do make parts for automobiles um, regionally as well as statewide. We have a number of, um, obviously in Michigan, there's a large car presence. Um, we have Toyota, Honda um, from Purdue. We have a number of students that go and work for them down in kind of the Indy area. So if you are interested in that, there's definitely a lot of opportunity in the state for you. Um, but yeah, kind of like Paul also mentioned, in engineering, you're gonna learn more about kind of the mathematics behind how something works, um, the equations for how you can determine if once you build it, if it's gonna work. Um, but there's not a lot of focus on, at least from a mechanical or electrical side, of focus on building a certain type of component that really comes into play when you get your first job and kind of depends on what, they, what that company does. Um, so I guess, Maybe one last question um, from another user question. Um, I know I had asked kind of what you thought was the, I don't know, I don't remember quite how we worded it. Um, one, one of the degrees that had the most long-term use um, and just kind of a consensus for mechanical based on personal preference and then kind of up and coming degrees. But another user question is asking um, what you would think is the degree with the greatest chance of getting a job. So I don't know if 
at your particular companies, if you're seeing a lot of people hired with a certain degree, if you wanna comment on that quickly so they know um, maybe what, what's hiring right now, obviously that can change in a few years or even a year, but anything you wanna to add to that? Um, yes. Like with Megan, if you have anything you wanna add? I think mechanicals, you know, as the most well-rounded, but electrical and even computer science, computer engineering, um, I think those choices, the options for jobs will always be there. Okay. Um, Paul, anything you want to add to that or any different yeah, degrees you're what seeing? Megan said, you know, the same exact thing, the mechanical, electrical, they've been around for years, they're not going anywhere. Um, really, that's the kind of the question the students should be asking, you know, universities, because they have statistics on who's hiring, uh, what the pay scales are and that sort of information. Um, and, you know, what it was last year and you know, the, everybody's always predicting where the world's going to be in 10 years and which fields are going to grow by 100% or 5% and which fields are going to decline. Uh, and I think that's kind of information you get out of the universities uh, before you kind of sign up for one, correct? I think if you ask the right questions, yeah, they should be able to tell you that, yeah. Um, and then Dan, anything, other predictions? Um, I see the trend of computer electrical, um, what, you know, with the automation and the digitizing of everything. Um, but uh, what, where I see the people being the most valuable is not only somebody that can do the programming in the background, but actually go to the instrument and make it work and diagnose it and troubleshoot it. Uh, you got to be the hands on too, you know, the a lot of people like to hide behind the computers and send emails and, and you know, there, there's some value there, but uh, there, somebody's more valuable if they have that background, but they can actually go out and, and fix it too, whether it's an automated machine manufacturing something and, and understand how the whole system works. But the digitizing computer and computer is uh, what I see advancing. Um. And then, so we've got maybe three minutes left. So maybe, I guess I'll give you a minute or so each. Any parting thoughts with people that are interested in the field? Should they be interested? Should they look elsewhere? Um, words of wisdom, I guess. Um, I'll start with you, Paul. Uh, I've always pushed people towards engineering. Um, I think it's a degree that you, once you get it and you decide you don't wanna be an engineer, you can still be a teacher, you can still be a lawyer, you can still be a doctor. It's by no means a dead end degree. You can do a lot of different things with it. Most people, you know, when you're 16 and 17 years old, thinking about what it is you're going to do with the rest of your life. You know, I've not heard the statistics, but I bet very few people end up doing what they were doing when they, when they were 16 or 17. So it's nice to get a four year degree uh, that's going to get you above average salary coming out the other side where you still have lots of options of what you might want to do with the rest of your life and a lot of opportunities. Um, same question, Megan. Piggyback with what Paul said, totally agree. Um, really helps build you as a, a well-rounded individual. And I think the best thing you can do is go get an internship as soon as possible before college and get that hands-on experience and really start trying to narrow down what it is that you like to do and that you want to do. Um, and then I guess same question to you, Dan, with an added one that just came in. Um, for mechanical engineering, do you work on locomotives or do you have any from kind of a power plant, I guess from a steam engine standpoint, um, any experience with integrating those? Um, it's funny because a lot of times I'd start with saying that I became an engineer because I wanted to drive a train, but I thought that I'm too old. Nobody would even get that joke anymore. <laughs> um, but uh, no, we don't deal with uh, steam locomotives. Um, we do have diesel generators that were on um, uh, Navy ships, but we do deal with steam uh, boilers that, uh, you know, again, take the fossil fuel, make steam, high pressure steam. And, and then with that, you can use it for propulsion through turbines and other things and heating. So I don't have any experience with actual trains and locomotives, no. Um, but, you know, anybody that's thinking about um, an engineering career, um, I would certainly uh, recommend going into it or at least exploring it. Um, as Paul said, you, you can't go wrong. Um, my daughter recently graduated from Riley. She went through the engineering magnet program. Um, she was foolish enough to think she wanted to be like her dad and be a mechanical engineer. 
Um, and she found out through that process that she didn't. Um, so she would come home and she would say, this, this particular class is driving me crazy. I don't like this. I'm like, well, dear, that is mechanical engineering. You, you, so you don't like it. You say you do, but you don't. But, you know, she finished the program, did well. And, you know, she has that technical science education through high school that she's utilizing in, in college now to do, you know, she's studying biology. Um, so you, you can't go wrong with, with the science and technology background of it. Um, and like, like Megan said, you know, get an internship, get exposure, uh, you know, out there, see what other people do. There's so many different um, um, organizations, technology industries that you can work in. And, you know, again, a mechanical engineer can mean a lot of different things. So go find what you like to do and, and get as much experience as early as you can. Thank you. We are at 301, so I'll go ahead and stop the session. But thank you to our panelists for answering the questions. And hopefully everyone learned something, has a little more of a feel for what engineering is, how it can relate to manufacturing, mechanical, electrical, and gives you some guidance on what you might want to do. And I'd like to give a big thanks to Megan for moderating and to our panelists, Megan Paul and the man whose first name is not on there. So I just was reading names and look what I did. Dan. <laughs> Dan. Yep. And um, I was reading from the wrong place, mm -hmm. threw me off. Um, and I'm laughing because I'm thinking about math people and science people and how sometimes we're not all like that. And I have a journalism degree and I tell kids all the time, if you can't figure out what you want to do, but you like to write, go into journalism and then you can work in any industry that you want to, because if you can write and communicate, you can kind of figure out what you're going to do next. So I've worked in architecture and healthcare and you can kind of just loop into other things as long as you can communicate. So it's kind of like the, the English lit side of engineering, I guess, mm -hmm. is the other. There's lots of skills that are really important, but I really appreciate all this insight and um, the, uh, we had good engagement from the students and I thank you for that. So um, again, we encourage all of you to visit the Manufacturing Day landing page on the Chamber website. I just keep saying, if you Google South Bend Chamber, you can find your way there because it's easier than giving the whole address for that. It is dropped into the chat as well. All the panels are being recorded, so you can check out other sessions, industry videos, pathway pages, all of that is on the Manufacturing Day landing page. Um, there are many, as you heard, even just right here on this one panel, the many businesses and opportunities and careers to explore in the South Bend region. So we encourage you to do that. And thanks again to all of you for participating. Appreciate it. Okay. Have a great Thank day. You. Thank you. Bye.